this morning is by Silvia Serfati in search of the abricots of lettuce, please. Thank you very much. So first I would like to, of course, thank the scientific committee for inviting me to give a lecture here. It's a great honor. And um, I will start also by apologizing because um, I am not going to talk about something that Poincaré worked on. Um, however, you know, if you, if you think of something that could have been in the spirit of Poincaré, you have to find, uh, you think that maybe it has to have some connection, some strong f connection with the physical phenomenon and some interesting mathematical content. So um, hopefully this is, uh, this is uh, f fulfilling this, uh, fitting the bill. <laughs> and so uh, it starts from a physical model, which is related to superconductivity. So in fact, superconductivity was discovered one year before uh, Poincaré's death in 1911, by, uh, somehow by accident, by Kamerling Owens. And so what, what turns out is that if you take these particular materials or alloys and cool them uh, below a certain critical temperature, they lose all resistivity. And it's explained, it, it's, it was explained later by the presence of superconducting electrons called Cooper pairs, which form superconducting currents. And one of the most uh, striking features of superconductors is this Meissner effect that you see here on this picture. Uh, which says that the superconductor repels an applied magnetic field, and by repelling a magnetic field, it can levitate above a magnet. And so here you see a, a nice picture of a superconductor in levitation. The other thing that happens is that there are some phase transitions uh, depending on the external uh, applied magnetic field. So there is a, what's called a first critical field, HC1, at which, in fact, the magnetic field does start to penetrate in the material, and it penetrates via what are um, vortices. So uh, these vortices are a bit like uh, the vortices that fluid mechanics um, talks about and that, that Poincaré had been interested in, uh, except that they are quantized, so they have a, an integer charge, and they correspond to, if you want, like a, a place where there is a normal phase so the, the superconductivity is lost in the center of the vortex, and they are surrounded by like superconducting currents, little loops of superconducting currents. And what you see is that uh, the higher the uh, applied field, the more vortices uh, will be present in the sample. And in fact, they arrange themselves in these things that are called abricots of lattices. So this is the term, um, from, the, from physics, uh, it's named after Abrikozov, the physicist who got a Nobel Prize for this in 2003, and who had predicted that such patterns should be observed. And later, after several years after his prediction, they, they were indeed observed. And you see that they, they, they are uh, perfect triangular lattices. And they are understood, they can be understood in a very heuristic manner uh, by the following reason. So, you have, a, you have these vortices and they repel each other. At the same time, they are sort of confined to stay in the material by the external field. So there is a sort of competition between confinement and repulsion. And in order to uh, arrange themselves in the most favorable way, they, they find these triangular lattices. And, and, and this is, in fact, something quite difficult to to explain and to understand mathematically as I'm going to try to, to show you. So <clears throat> the um, Abrikozov prediction was based on the model by Ginzburg and Landa that was introduced in the 50s uh, on purely phenomenological basis. So uh, later it was explained by a quantum theory. Um, but, but at the time, it, it, was, it was just phenomenological, and it, it proved to be very, very successful in describing, um, in, in re-predicting the, the phenomena that happen in superconductors. And so again, these uh, 
earned them uh, Nobel Prizes. I mean, Lando got the Nobel Prize for many other things, but Ginsburg certainly got it for this model. And so here, here is the, uh, the model. It says basically that the states of the sample are the things that minimize this energy functional. So just a few things here. Um, for simplicity, I will restrict to a two-dimensional domain. And the vortices, if you want to understand them from the, from the model, they correspond to the zeros of this complex valued function psi that's here. And uh, the, the, they, have, they come with a charge or a degree, which is the winding number of the zeros in the complex plane. And here there are two parameters, the intensity of the external field here and epsilon, which is a material parameter and corresponds to the size, the characteristic size of the vortex core. And it will be taken to go to zero. And A here is the gauge of the magnetic field. So I'm not going to give too many uh, mathematical descriptions of this, but th th this, is, this is a model that um, with, uh, with my collaborator, Etienne Sandier, we, we have been working on for, for many years. And one of the uh, sort of eventual conclusions of our work was that if you want to understand the minimization of G epsilon, in the end, you find that uh, vortices essentially interact indeed according to a Coulomb type of interactions as if they were uh, electric charges uh, in, in the plane interacting with, the, with simple electrostatic um, uh, behavior. And so that, that, that justifies this explanation that I was giving you before. It's as if you had charges that were repelling each other and that were confined together by an external potential. And in fact, it turns out that there is a much simpler model that uh, contains these ingredients, which is a discrete model, which is also, um, also a sort of classic standard model, which is the model of a Coulomb gas. So let's focus on this one for a moment. Um, and in this model, you just have n particles or n points sitting in the plane or on the real line. That's a variant that's also interesting. So here they sit in Rz with d equals 1 or 2. And you see that we, um, we have in this model uh, a sum of logarithmic repulsions between the points. So this thing will become very, very large if the points get close to each other. And we have a sum of, uh, we have a, a, the effect of a confining potential, capital V. So think of capital V as something that grows at infinity, uh, say, for example, that grows quadratically at infinity. And the, uh, the parameters here the, are cooked up in such a way that the two effects balance each other, the effect of the repulsion and the effect of the confinement. So this is... Uh, again, what's uh, the Hamiltonian of a Coulomb gas, and in, if, if, if it's in one dimension, if the points are constrained to live on the real line, it's called a log gas, because then the, the logarithm is no longer the Coulomb kernel in, in one dimension. So a motivation for uh, studying this model, for studying minimizers of this, uh, there are several motivations, actually, but one of them is that Minimizers of this also happen to be maximizers of this type of uh, pairwise interaction, where you have here the product of the distance times the product of the exponential. So to see this, just take the exponential of minus w. And these things arise in a completely different context, in the context of interpolation, and are called weighted fekete sets. I will come back to that a bit later. Um, so this is, this is no longer about physics, this is about um, uh, trying to find best interpolants for numerical computations, for example. And you can also note that you can reduce yourself to products of such distances on manifolds, so for example on the sphere, by choosing a potential V appropriately and using stereographic projection. So, Really, a motivation uh, for this can be to study uh, the maximization of such products and, uh, on any general manifold, two-dimensional surface, uh, if possible. Okay, so the uh, question in, in this, in this uh, 
setting is to understand now the limit as n, the number of points, tends to infinity. Okay, how do the points, you know, how do the points arrange themselves in order to minimize this total interaction? So here is a numerical simulation for a quadratic potential for 29 points, and you see they, they tend to arrange themselves relatively uniformly in something that looks like a disk. Uh, but n here is not yet very, very large. So we'll see what happens for a larger n. Um, this thing is, in fact, more interesting even if you add a temperature to the system and you start to do statistical mechanics. So the, the Coulomb gas is really a, a statistical mechanics model where you're looking at a, a probability measure on the space of configurations of n points, x1, xn, again, that live either in the plane or on the real line. And here you see you put in uh, the, the standard Gibbs factor, so you put it exponential minus beta times the Hamiltonian, where beta represents the inverse of a temperature. And z is the normalization factor that makes this whole thing a probability. And wn is as before. So <clears throat> this thing is, is interesting in physics, but it turns out that it also has some close connection uh, with something that arises from probability theory, which is, uh, which is random matrix models. So if you take these particular, very particular values of beta, which are one and two, and if you take the points to live in dimension one or two, then it turns out that this probability here is nothing else than the law of eigenvalues for some random matrix models that are like the most, most classical random matrix models. So what I mean by that is the following. You take an n by n matrix and you draw the entries at random according to a Gaussian law, and you draw them in an independent manner, so it's IID uh, random variables, okay, so Gaussian entries, and then you compute the law of the eigenvalues. And what you find is exactly this. You find exactly this law of the eigenvalues, so then it depends on the symmetry that you impose on the matrix, so if you don't impose any symmetry, the eigenvalues are going to live on the complex plane. And it corresponds to this case, what's called the Gini ensemble, uh, for the case of V quadratic and beta equals two. If you impose the matrix to be real symmetric or complex Hermitian, then you're going to have eigenvalues that live naturally on the real line by symmetry, and again, the law of the eigenvalues is going to follow some formula of this type with beta equals either one or two and v quadratic, and these are called the Gaussian unitary ensemble and the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. So there is a very, very large literature on random matrices and things of this form, and most of it uh, exploits the fact that there is a, a matrix model behind, which means there is some sort of algebra that allows you to make computations and to understand uh, what the eigenvalues can do. But at least what, uh, what you can see from this Coulomb analogy, from the analogy between eigenvalues of the random matrices and the Coulomb gas model, which was first noticed by Wigner, by the way, and exploited by Dyson, what you find is that the eigenvalues of these random matrices tend to repel each other in a Coulomb manner. In fact, the eigenvalues interact exactly like Coulomb particles in a confined potential. And here is a plot, uh, here is a numerical simulation for the eigenvalues of uh, matrices without symmetry, so uh, matrices with just IID Gaussian entries. And what you see is indeed that the the eigenvalues, there are many, many of them, they tend to distribute, it, to distribute themselves sort of uniformly, and you will observe that they distribute themselves in a disk, and they repel each other. At least you can see that they tend to be not too close to each other uh, on this picture. 
So one of the things that we would like to understand is uh, something more precise about this distribution. And in particular, is it true that if you decrease the temperature, which in physics corresponds to um, decreasing the disorder, will you see those points um, crystallize and organize themselves according to abricots of lattices? Right, so you see here there is a certain, still a certain amount of disorder, but this we know corresponds to the value of temperature beta equals two. So what happens as beta gets larger, um, we can expect that it's somehow related to what happens in vortices and superconductors. So this is, this is really the punchline of the story already. So another model, just to give you another example that's of interest to um, the physics community is, is a model of dye block copolymers, which is called the Ota Kawasaki model. And just to show you very briefly, it's a model where you have, a, it's a phase field model where you have a, a function u which takes values plus and minus one, and its average is prescribed. You have a Green's kernel, or a Green's function here, g, and you see that these. Uh, this, this U thing can be seen as a set of positive and negative charges that interact with itself in this Coulombic manner, except that here you add another term that essentially penalizes the perimeter of the interface between the plus one and the minus one phase. So this is essentially what's written here. You have two phases interacting uh, via a screen Coulomb kernel, and this is the perimeter of the phase. And the, there is this competition because the perimeter term, of course, wants everything to be relatively round and in one piece. And the Coulomb uh, kernel interaction here prefers some rapid oscillations between plus and minus one. And so again, you have a competition between two effects. So it turns out that in this model, there are many, many possible regimes, but People expect that minimizers of such a thing are periodic, exhibit periodic patterns. And numerically, you see periodic patterns. However, uh, mathematically, it seems almost impossible to prove. Very few things have been proven. So this is a numerical plot of, of what happens in this model. You see you have these two phases, plus and minus one, represented on the picture by black and white. And so essentially the, the, white, the white repels each other and the black repels itself. <laughs> and the, the perimeter of the interface is penalized and you see this is the effect of trying to optimize these two competing constraints, these two uh, contradictory <laughs> constraints. And uh, we'll be interested in the situation where the white phase becomes very, very small compared to the black phase. You, you can prescribe this... Uh, the volume of each phase. And so in that case, you, will see, you see immediately that essentially the white things are going to become points. And we are back to the same setting where you have points interacting in the plane. And in fact, we will have similar results on this model as well. OK, so in, in three models I have mentioned, Gibbs-Bolando, Coulomb gas, or Fekete sets, and Ota Kawasaki, we have these same ingredients, in the end, we should have a 2D Coulomb interaction with large, large number of points. And we expect to see some sort of pattern formation in, uh, in minimizers, uh, some periodicity, and even to see this abricots of lattice uh, showing up. OK, so let's see what is known. What is known, and I will do it only on the second, the simplest model, the one that's discrete, the Coulomb gas, where I have n points, x1, xn, and assume they minimize wn. Then you can form the probability distribution, which is the sum of Dirac masses at the points, normalized by the number of points. Okay, so this is a probability distribution. And it's known that it will converge to a certain probability mu zero, which is the minimizer of this interaction energy now, which is simply the continuum version of the previous um, discrete interaction. 
So the, this thing has a unique minimum among probability measures because it's convex. It's strictly convex. And in fact, uh, all this has been understood since the 50s. This is the basis of what's called potential theory, uh, which goes back to actually Gauss, and which consists in understanding um, things that minimize such energies. All right, so there is, is going to be this mu zero, which is the equilibrium measure. And for example, if you take V quadratic, then you compute, you find that mu zero is essentially the characteristic function of the unit ball, properly normalized to be a probability measure. And so what this corresponds to is exactly this picture, because you see here the, the probability of finding a point is converging to the uh, constant density on the unit ball. It's a constant density supported in a disk. <clears throat> okay, so the point after that is to try to say something more precise. So beyond this mean field limit, if you sort of expand around this behavior of n mu zero, and you, you look at the uh, the error that you make compared to that, you are able to find next order terms which should tell you something about the microscopic distribution of the points. So here is the sort of rough picture. You have many, many points that are going to be distributed in a set, which is the support of the equilibrium measure. We know what's the global density of the points, what's the sort of macroscopic density. But as you zoom at scale root n, so uh, because of course you're in dimension two, so if you have n points in dimension two in a box of fixed size, the typical distance should be one over root n. So if you blow up at this scale around a point, you will see a configuration of points now which are well separated from each other and which should fill the whole plane as n goes to infinity. Okay, so if you're on the real line, it's the same situation. You have a point living on a certain segment with a certain density. And if you zoom, you're going to have points that now live on the line. And so you would like to understand the microscopic arrangement of the points by understanding um, the sort of energy that governs the distribution of this, these points on the real line, or these points, sorry, these points in the plane, or these points on the real line, which are the blown up uh, configuration. Okay, so there is some computations involved in doing this. This is a hard part of the work. But what we find in the end is that these points, after blow up, they interact according to Again, a logarithmic interaction, but you can see them as screened by a fixed background charge. So it's what physics, uh, phys the physics literature calls a, sometimes a jellium. So it's not, it's not very important, but it means that there is something that makes them hold together, even though they repel each other logarithmically. It's as if there was a background charge that's exactly uniform and negative, so it's opposite, and it holds them together because it has the opposite sign to the positive charges. So mathematically, we find ourselves with, with this equation, where you see here you have H, which is like the electrostatic potential generated by a sum of positive charges, Dirac's, at the points, and this negative background charge that I was mentioning. And so lambda now, at the limit when n goes to infinity, lambda is just this infinite discrete set of points filling up the whole plane. <clears throat> so the point is we are able to define a total interaction energy of this set of points. So I, I will give you formulas here, but you don't have to really follow them. Um, so essentially the, the energy that we define, call it W, is defined based on H, and it's Define essentially like this. So it's essentially consists in taking the limit over larger and larger boxes of the uh, square norm of the gradient of H, except that it has to be computed 
in a renormalized way because these things, that, th these things don't converge. So here is the proper way to do it if you're interested. Okay, so we have a definition which works for arbitrary configuration of points in the plane, and this is the point. So you have an infinite number of points, they fill up the whole plane, and instead of summing their pairwise Coulomb interactions with some sort of infinite sum, you replace this difficulty by, by computing something which is local and which is more like amenable. So there was this case of the line. So here I described the situation in the plane. So in the line, it's, in fact, it's the same. So what you find if you blow up is you find a sum of Dirac masses. And what you can do is you can embed the real line into the plane and solve for this equation, which means you can, you can view the positive charges on the real line as living in the plane, and you can compute the potential H that they generate on the whole plane, provided that uh, instead of having this constant one as a background charge, now you put a constant density on the real line as the background charge. So you, you make a sort of singular charge on the real axis, which is negative, and it's going to sort of balance these uh, positive charges, positive discrete charges on the real line. And if you compute, uh, you can then compute the energy of this configuration in the same way as if, you, if it were in 2D. Uh, and so this gives an energy, and, and the point is that we can derive it as a li uh, the limit of the original problem. That's the main point. Okay, so this is the way to compute. So you have this configuration of points in the plane, which is infinite. You take balls of radius r, and you average over larger and larger balls uh, this energy. And if you're in the real line, you, make, you embed this real axis into the plane, and you compute over larger and larger strips the electrostatic energy generated by these guys. So the point is that this thing can be derived rigorously from the previous model, okay? So what we show is that after blow up, around almost any blow up center in the support of the equilibrium measure, you converge to minimizers of this limit energy W. So we did it for ginzburg landau we did it for Coulomb gases and for the Otakawasaki model that I mentioned before. Huh? So, so this, is, this is really the picture. We have this picture, we know the sort of average distribution, and when we blow up, these guys have to minimize a certain interaction energy. And hopefully this is going to start to explain why they arrange themselves <laughs> triangularly. Okay, so that's the next question. What are the minima of this W? So first thing is, you might want to have a more um, tractable formula for this W. I gave you a definition, which is valid for arbitrary configurations in the plane. Here is a computation when you assume something more, which is when you assume that the distribution of points, lambda, the discrete set of points, has some periodicity. So if you assume that it's a pattern of points that gets like repeated indefinitely, the same pattern, then you, you can compute the W in a much more explicit fashion, and you find again what you would expect, which means you find again a sum of pairwise interactions. So here G can be computed explicitly. It's the Green's function of the underlying torus on which these points live. This thing is a constant, which is also explicit. And so you find yourself with trying to minimize this sum of G of AJ minus AK over a set of, say, N points, which are, again, repeated periodically. Okay, so there is a formula. So even though we gave a complicated definition, in a, at least in some simpler settings, it amounts, again, to something you would expect and to something much more explicit a discrete energy, a discrete sort of Coulomb interaction. So you see the effect of the background is that instead of having a log here, 
you have rather the Green's function of a torus, which is something slightly different. So it's the solution to this, by the way. Okay, so this G, if you want, you can express it even more explicitly. You can solve for the Green's function of a torus, and you find uh, some Eisenstein series. So, so G can be expressed as an Eisenstein series. Uh, and it turns out that I found that such quantities also arise. You can even write them on general Riemann surfaces. They arise in, in Arakelov theory, and they are called heights. So um, the question here is to identify the configuration of points A1 to AN, which minimize such a thing, such a height. And, uh, well, maybe if there are a number of theorists in the room that have ideas, we would be interested in some sort of advertising for the problem. Okay, so there is one thing we can do, which is that we can minimize this formula among configurations which are already themselves a perfect lattice. Okay, so a simple lattice, if you want. Right? So you take configuration of points, which are just zu plus zv with u and v, two vectors, such that the unit cell has volume one, so you normalize the volume. Okay, so then you only have two parameters of minimization, which is essentially the angle between the two vectors and the uh, size of one of them. And then using the explicit formulas that I showed you before, which means using the formulas in terms of Eisenstein series, you find that this guy, this function w, is minimized among the lattices by the triangular lattice. So this is the place where you're like, because we derived this limiting interaction energy, and at least we can see that it makes the difference between different kinds of lattices. So it sees a, microscoping, uh, a microscopic behavior, and it can tell you that the triangular lattice is the best among all lattices. So the triangular lattice is better than, say, the square lattice. So this is the one thing we can prove. The triangular lattice is better than all the other lattices. However, we don't know to prove that it's better than anyone else, which wouldn't be a lattice. Okay, but at least it's consistent with the observations that I showed you at the beginning on superconductors where you see these triangular lattices, this Abrikosov lattice. All right, so the proof of this, in fact, uh, boils down to using theorems from the 50s that were already known on, uh, on number theoretic uh, quantities. So here you state the zeta function so you form the zeta function of a lattice. So here now lambda is a lattice, right? So you sum 1 over p to the power s over points in the lattice. So when s is equal to 2, this is critical. This sum would not converge. And it turns out that when s is strictly bigger than 2, this can be viewed as one way of regularizing this sum. And the Eisenstein series thing that we have to compute here is a sort of another way of re regularizing the same sum, sum of 1 over p squared. And what we can prove is that they are essentially equivalent. So you can, you can transform one minimization problem into the other. And then fortunately, the other minimization problem had been solved. So the question of minimizing this thing among lattices uh, had been solved, and it was known that the best is the triangular lattice. Okay, so here, uh, modular functions and number theory are the things that give you the answer. A little uh, digression, which is there is another proof of this fact about the zeta function due to Montgomery. So what he observes is that the zeta function is the Mellin transform of the theta function. And now the theta function is this thing. You sum exponentially uh, decaying terms over the lattice. And you ask yourself, again, the same thing. What is the lattice that minimizes this quantity? And so Montgomery, Montgomery proves that, again, among lattices, it's the triangular which is the best. 
And then by using the fact that the zeta function is the Mellin transform, you obtain the result for the zeta function. And the, the reason why I'm mentioning this is that it turns out that in superconductivity, again in the Gins-Bolando model, but in a different regime of external field than the one I was studying, so there's a sort of two different regimes of external field, then you find this problem. So you, ha you also have an Abrikozov lattice. And what you find is that if you try to explain why this Abrikozov lattice, you find to a minimization problem. You find a minimization problem which, once restricted to lattices, gives you the question of minimizing this theta function. So both the theta function and the sort of zeta function, which are Mellin transforms of each other, arise in the same superconductivity model. And why, why that is so far, I can't say. I can't understand. Okay, so this is a remark. And so we are led to this question, which is just what I said before. We can conjecture now that this triangular lattice is not only the best among all pure lattices, but it's the best among all possible configurations, or at least that it achieves the global minimum of this function W that we define. Okay? And maybe a, a reason supporting the conjecture is simply the experiment, right? Since you see that in superconductors there are triangular lattices, since we derived the fact that rigorously from the gins bolando equation, from the gins bolando model, we should see a minimum of this W, while nature gives it to you, nature's, nature tells you, well, the minimum should be the triangular lattice. Now, go prove it. We have no idea how to prove it. Um, at least what I can say is that W can be expected to be a sort of quantitative measure of disorder of a configuration of points in the plane. If you think that the, the most ordered configurations are the triangular lattice, the most order is the triangular lattice, and things that have a higher W then would be more disordered, if you want. So now there is the one-dimensional case, which is particular. So I told you there was a one-dimensional version of W, and then you can, again, compute everything explicitly, and then you can completely solve the question. So in, in one dimension, it's not too, too difficult to show that the regular configuration, which is Z, Putting the points, putting the points equally spaced, is the minimum over all possible configurations. Achieves the minimum. Of course, one D is much easier than two D. Right? You have much, much less geometry in one D. All right. So, what do we do once we have proven this? We have derived this W as a sort of rigorous limit from these problems with large number of particles. So just a few things that we do. We expand the partition function. Uh, we get a, a finer asymptotic expansion of the partition function, which was not known before. We get a, a large deviations type result, which tells you that essentially, if you have finite temperature, there is going to be a threshold uh, below which all the configurations live except with very small probability. So W has to be smaller than a th certain threshold as N goes to infinity, and this threshold decreases as the temperature is decreased. The threshold converges to the minimum of W, which means that as you let the temperature decrease, you should indeed crystallize to the minimizing configurations for this W. And if you believe that the minimum is the triangular lattice, this conjecture that we don't know how to prove, then it gives you a proof of crystallization in the Coulomb gas. Okay, and in 1D, of course, you have a complete proof because in 1D, the minimum is identified. And two things I want to point out, which are um, two things that sort of follow from our analysis is that if you want to solve the conjectures, there are two different things that would suffice, but that both seem very difficult. So the first thing is, it would suffice to compute the minimum 
over periodic configurations, but periodic with respect to a larger and larger box. Okay, so that means if I give you again this formula, right, which is the formula when I have like just n points in a torus repeated periodically, if you want, if you can identify the minimum of this and let the size of the box go to infinity, or let n go to infinity, then uh, it's, it would suffice to, to identify the minimum. Right? So it suffices to identify the minimum over periodic configurations as long as you can take the period arbitrarily large. But still this we don't know how to do. Okay. Second option is compute this integral. This integral is the partition function of the Coulomb gas. Right? It's an explicit integral but with a number of variables that goes to infinity. So if you can compute this integral and take the limit beta goes to infinity in the order n term, you would find the minimum of W. The problem is that, as far as I know, nobody knows how to compute this integral, except if beta equals 2. So if beta equals 2, you can recognize here a square of a van der Mond determinant, and using the fact that it's a square of a determinant, you can expand, and there's some algebraic manipulations that you can do, and eventually you completely compute ex exactly Zn. But when beta is not equal to two, it seems you cannot do the first trick, and you're sort of blocked here. Except in dimension one, if you replace R2 with R1, then these integrals are computed. They are called Zellberg integrals. And this thing is completely known. Okay, so again, two open problems. So now I would like to maybe extend the picture a little bit. What we, what we find ourselves with is, in fact, a, a crystallization problem. And there are many such things in, in nature. and it's, it's a more general family of problems. You know, you give yourself some interaction potential V, and you look at the sum of pairwise interactions V of Xi minus Xj over a family of points in the plane and maybe some kind of boundary conditions, I don't know. And you ask ourselves, uh, we ask ourselves, when can we say that the minimum of this total interaction is to put the points on a lattice? Right? put the points on a perfect, say, triangular lattice. So really the importance of this question, I think, cannot be uh, understated because this is really the reason why matter organizes itself in crystals, right? You minimize the sum of total interactions between, between atoms, say, in three dimensions, typically, and you want to understand why things organize themselves periodically. And what I would like to tell you is that there's very, very few instances where we can explain this rigorously. Note another uh, area where this arises. There's this thing called the Cohn and Kumar conjecture, where uh, they take a potential like this, so they take this sort of minimization problem, and they say if it's of the form f of x squared with f completely monotonic, so what completely monotonic means is this. So the, each derivative, each case derivative has the sign of minus one to the k. Okay? Then they conjecture that the minimum of this is achieved by the triangular lattice always. So that's in dimension two, and they also have a conjecture in dimension eight. There is something that the E8 root lattice that would do it in dimension 24 the Leech lattice. So that means that the abricos of lattice is expected to have some sort of universal minimizing property. It's going to minimize a large class, a large class of such, of such problems. And, and so you can ask the problem differently. What is the class of potentials V for which the minimum is the triangular lattice? Right. So again, we don't know. And, and so, as I said, there are very, if you even enlarge the problem and you ask yourself, given a minimization problem, minimize an energy, an interaction, blah, uh, 
when do we know that the minimizer is periodic? When can we prove that the minimizer has some periodicity? Either than in dimension one, which as I showed you, I showed you one example. Either in, other than in dimension one, there's very few instances. I mean, I, I, I don't know many. So it, it's something that's sort of very intriguing, and at the same time, we don't really have any tool to attack such a problem. So let me give you a few positive answers. Few positive answers. The first positive answer is the sphere packing question. So in two dimensions, you take, uh, you take disks of fixed size, and you want to arrange themselves in such a way that maximizes the number of disks that you can put in a box, or if you want, you, you minimize the interaction with the hard sphere potential. Then it was proven by writing in uh, the 80s that the triangular lattice is the minimizer, which is, of course, what you would intuitively expect, but you know, to go and prove it is something else. So this is the proof of this. Now, this was slightly extended by Florian Tile in 2006, where he looks at the, uh, again, this sort of interaction where, where V is a slight perturbation of the uh, hard sphere's potential. So he takes a potential of this, this form, which is sort of caricature of a Leonard drawn potential, where you see there is a fixed distance which is, uh, which is very highly favored. So it's very highly favored to put the, potential, the points at distance, say, one here from their nearest neighbor. And for such a, for such a potential, he manages to give a, a rigorous proof of crystallization. And this is almost the only proof. These two are almost the only proofs that are known, I would say, um, on this on crystallization problems. So now, if you compare to our problem, we're, we're very far off because in our problem, we have a very long range interaction. The interaction is logarithmic, whereas this thing is very short range. So uh, we're really not in good shape to apply any of their, uh, of their results. Now, there is something a little uh, surprising even, which is that there is another problem which is solved and which doesn't look so far off from ours. So um, I would like to rephrase our question in the following way. So you can sort of heuristically wave your hands and see that the, minima, the, mini, the question of minimization of W is the same, essentially, as the question of minimizing a sort of H1 star norm of sum of Dirac's minus 1. So H1 star denotes the dual of H1, whatever that means, some functional space, right? So, what you're trying to do is you're trying to minimize a certain way of measuring the difference between the sum of Dirac's and the constant one. Okay? And so now there is this problem, which is to measure this distance in the dual of the Lipschitz functions. And this thing is, is in fact the same as measuring the Wasserstein distance in optimal transportation between the sum of the Dirac masses and the constant charge one. So um, concretely, what this means is the following problem. You're given, you give yourself points in the plane. You imagine it fills up the whole plane. Right? And you want to attribute to each point a certain domain of the plane of volume one. And all the mass that's in this domain, you attribute it to the point. And you compute the integral of the, on the cell CI of simply the distance between each running point and the point XI, the black point. Right? So you take all the mass on the cell and you transport it according to the Mosh Kantorovich transport problem onto the point. Right? And the cost that you pay is essentially each unit of mass that you transport into the point, you, you pay the cost equal to the distance to the point. Okay? So this is, this is the, and then you integrate, right? So this is the total cost. For each unit of mass, you pay x minus xi, and you integrate over the cell. And so the question is, what is the best partition of cells, and what is the best distribution of the points in order to minimize this whole thing? Right, so what is the way that if you want, if you, want you, you, you can transport the mass to these points 
in the most efficient way? Well, it is the triangular lattice, and this is a, there is a proof in preparation by Born, Pelty, and Tile, which hopefully <laughs> will appear soon. So they managed to really prove it. The best distribution is the triangular lattice. And you see, this is for a different way of measuring this distance. So it's very strange that for this way, in fact, the proof is not very, very difficult. You can do it. I mean, it's smart, but it's, it's, it doesn't seem extremely, extremely hard. And when you change it into this, we have no idea. OK, so here, these are a few, a few positive results. And now, uh, another positive result, by the way, is this honeycomb conjecture by, uh, solved by Hales in 2001 which tell you that if you want to minimize the perimeter among tilings by region of equal area, the honeycomb uh, lattice does the best. Right? Uh, so now, uh, just one minute. I will take one minute to say, to come back to this fekete point. So you remember there was this question on minimizing fekete, uh, distribution of fekete points on a manifold, so the product of xi minus xj, or more generally, this thing with Reese kernels, the sum of 1 over xi minus xj to the power s. So in fact, this thing comes up a lot in this question of interpolation, because the optimal points give you the best way of interpolating a function and of computing numerically integrals. There is a whole very interesting article by Saf and Kulars in, a, in a Mathematical Intelligencer. And they explain why these things are interesting. One of the reasons they give is the understanding of the carbon molecules that live on sphere, you know, these soccer ball types molecules, but also interpolation, etc. And so here is a picture that you find here for numerical computation of fekete points on the torus. And you see, you, you do like to believe that if you zoom around the point, you see a triangular lattice. Right? The picture seems very, very telling in that case. And so what, what was conjectured, in fact, is that if you take this energy and if you expand in powers of n, you have an expansion all the way to O of 1. And people ask, you know, to prove this thing. So what we should be able to prove now is that the order n term, this constant here, is the minimum of W. So we should be able to identify this constant and relate it to this other minimization problem. And maybe to prove to you that this thing uh, is of interest to people, I just want to finish by saying that this was asked as, something like this was asked by Smale as a seventh problem for the next century. So what happened is at the beginning of the 21st century, so this one, this century, uh, mathematicians congregated and they tried to reproduce what Hilbert had done in 1900, which is to phrase problems for the next century, right? And so this thing was uh, recorded as Smale's seventh problem. So it's again, it's to find, it's to find a minimization problem, this minimization problem on the sphere, but to provide an algorithm that will give you a minimizer up to an error of log n. Okay? So this thing is, con is considered very, very difficult. Of course, you want to do it in polynomial time. And the reason why it's difficult is because if you look at the local minima, of this interaction energy, um, the, the number of local minima is expected to grow exponentially in n. And so algorithmically, you know, if you compute, you have a very large chance of being stuck in a local minima, not knowing how to extract yourself from there. And so whether this is solvable in polynomial time or not uh, is not known. Okay, so I hope I've tried to convince you that this Abrikozov lattice is in superconductivity, but is also sort of everywhere, and uh, that there are some interesting math problems uh, related to that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Poincaré attached a, a great importance to the least action principle, so I'm sure he would have liked your lecture. Thank you. Uh, are there <laughs> questions? Etienne? Did you make some kind of numerical simulation or computation on the quasi-periodic crystals like Penrose tilings or something? Uh, we, you know, some of them have a high degree of quasi-symmetries. 
So maybe some of them are just better than the equilateral lattice. Did yeah. you, maybe, maybe you can make some computation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, there are some, first of all, it's difficult to do computations with this because, again, you get stuck in local, you, you cannot prove that you have a global minimum, right? It's very difficult to show that you're not in a local minimum. Sure, 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 sure. But so, so far, no one has found anything better. So all the numerical computations seem to go in the direction of the triangular lattice. Not me, not myself, but some people have done, yeah. And, and they, they seem to, as far as you can see, you don't see any quasi-crystals. <laughs> That's all I can say. But who knows? Other questions? Remark, yes. Sorry, you mentioned. Uh, you, uh, you mentioned beta equals one and beta equals two, mm. and uh, this corresponding to real and complex case. Uh, but beta equals four wouldn't yes. it correspond to the quaterni some yeah. kind of quaternionic case? And can't it be, for instance, simulated with or uh, and, uh, understood more efficiently analytically? So yes, beta equals four is the quaternionic case. Um, that, that's just more difficult to, to analyze because the computations are more complicated. From the algebraic point of view, the you know, probabilists work on this. But in fact, the point is not that. The point is that you only have one, two, four for which you can say anything uh, using these. And then in dimension one, there are these tridiagonal mat matrices which can work for any beta, et cetera. But yeah, it's just that uh, uh, beta, uh, temperature of one half uh, seems higher than temperature of one fourth. Just that yes. it would be one more. Yes. So what you can do is you can see as you increase beta in these models whether you indeed see more order mm -hmm. in the local statistics, and you do. You do. So we did some computations uh, which compute W for these um, processes that are obtained as local you know, local uh, limits of matrix models, and you observe that W decreases as beta goes, increases, but you cannot make a whole curve, but yeah. it seems to fit, like everything seems to fit quite well. Thank you. No other questions? So thank you again very much. <laughs> the next talk is at 2.30.